Hello and welcome to this presentation on gender ideology from GATES. My name is Ellen Murray and I'm the lead consultant for gender ideology with GATES. This will cover what gender ideology is, where it developed from, how it affects trans and gender diverse people's lives, and how organizations can help combat this developing threat against human rights across much of the world. So what is gender ideology? Gender ideology is argued as the result of a well-funded lobby of human rights activists, particularly LGBTI individuals and groups, feminist movements and bodily autonomy activists overall. They argue that gender ideology is the result of our work and that it is a threat. What gender ideology actually is, is a framework to resist and attempt to roll back off LGBTI rights, women's rights and bodily autonomy more generally. The key proponents of this framework fall into a, a few different groups. This includes anti-trans feminist campaigners. Now we put feminist in quotes here because in the effort to resist trans rights ultimately results in anti-feminist philosophy and behavior and campaigning. This is usually from groups who would nominally call themselves radical feminists. Um, however, this forms a, a very small minority of feminist campaigners. Um, and we find the vast majority of feminist movements are positive towards trans and gender diverse people's rights. The second group and where this term originated from is ultra conservative religious organizations. And then this combines with the third group that I'll talk about, which is the far right. These latter two groups um, have joined up a lot of their approaches and are responsible for uh, a large proportion of the proliferation of gender ideology across much of the world today. So this didn't come out of nowhere. Gender ideology is a relatively new term in the context of human rights. It originally came about uh, through mostly Catholic and Pentecostal church uh, groups um, and faith leaders within Europe. Gender ideology uh, in the late 1990s and in the 2000s was developed pre predominantly as an argument against secular approaches to human rights and women and children's rights in the face of developing law, regulation and social attitude. This term then has been adopted by those anti-trans, in air quotes again, feminist actors and activists, sometimes by activists who were not previously hostile, but usually uh, as a new framing of long-standingly hostile work against trans people's rights, particularly trans women's rights. The term was then adopted uh, by far-right nationalist groups. Depending on where these groups are in the world, it can take different forms, um, but usually it incorporates some combination of a threat to traditional values, a threat to family life and the, the nuclear family as a protected group and towards the freedom of uh, religious groups uh, to practice. And gender ideology, its framework and its language is also now used by various governments around the world, um, including some very recent examples in Hungary, in Brazil and in the United States of America to directly prevent progressions in human rights for trans and gender diverse people or to actively roll back um, either the human rights protections that they have or the services that the state or private uh, bodies provide to those groups. The major arguments of the proponents of this threat are that gender ideology often uh, ignores the reality of physical sex. Now, I have these quotes within quotes because they are the arguments of anti-gender activists and they, they really don't reflect human rights arguments or arguments of, of communities on the ground. Uh, but the ignorance of physical sex is often argued by those, in air quotes, feminist groups, uh, because trans people are, are argued not to be really their gender. Within those groups also is that uh, particularly uh, rights for trans women threaten the safety of women generally uh, by allowing them into single sex spaces. And they argue that this ultimately eradicates the concept of single sex spaces. Now, this ignores the reality in, in much of the world that uh, trans women have been using uh, women's spaces for, for a long time now. But it is a common argument. Within these groups also, and then within uh, the far right, 
the argument that uh, gender ideology threatens children's rights and their safety is increasingly common, particularly because gender affirming healthcare services, um, so services that support trans individuals and may help them to medically transition, threaten children by allowing them to access what they purport to be dangerous medical treatments. Um, and this is often one of the, the most successful arguments that these groups use because invoking the protection of children is a reliable argument by, by many anti-rights uh, campaigners. Perhaps surprisingly, some of these groups purport to stand up for other LGBTI people um, and particularly argue that gender ideology encourages, coerces or exploits lesbian, gay and bisexual people to medically transition, sometimes to escape homosexuality, um, which is untrue in the main and really also ignores the fact that uh, a huge major- a huge number of uh, trans and gender diverse people would fall into um, these categories before and after transition as well. Quickly growing um, argument and one that I have a personal interest in is the argument against disabled people and especially disabled young people from uh, being able to transition or, or live in the way that they want. Arguments around this usually uh, rely on misconceptions that disabled people often don't know what they what is best for them and they don't know what they need. And it is argued by these anti-gender activists that disabled people are exploited by uh, gender affirming services or lax legal protections um, to allow them to transition. Now, in the context of human rights, disabled people always have the right to legal capacity and to make decisions about their own lives in line with non-disabled people. Um, But this is a moral argument rather than a legal argument, but it's a moral argument that's used to pressure changes in legal structures. Um, Particularly within uh, ultra-conservative religious organizations and in the far right, uh, arguments that gender ideology threatens traditional values um, are quite long-standing within anti-LGBTI campaigners. Um, This is really an adoption of this new framework for a, a very old argument. The proliferation of hate speech legislation across various parts of the world has been argued by um, anti-rights campaigners for a long time um, that freedom of speech is being threatened as a result of those uh, pieces of legislation and again they have been adopted to uh, resist the hate speech protections that trans and gender diverse people are increasingly being able to access. In countries outside uh, Uh, Non-Western companies and those in the Global South, uh, state bodies, um, religious organizations and the far right uh, may also argue that uh, human rights protections for trans and gender diverse people or LGBTI people in general or access to abortion, sexual and reproductive rights are a form of imperialism against um, uh, traditional communities in the Global South. And although there is a, a, a lot of imperialism present in a lot of human rights activism, um, campaigns for trans people's human rights um, usually originate from those communities, uh, regardless of where they are in the world. This uh, argument can certainly be uh, interrogated a lot more, though. So the goals of anti-gender actors are relatively diverse, um, but they usually collate around themes of restricting the rights and lived experiences uh, and quality of life of trans and gender diverse people. Rollbacks and reversals of legislative and regulatory protection are common, um, particularly uh, discrimination protections in employment, in goods, facilities and services, and calls for removal of decriminalization or repealing of decriminalization legislation um, in areas where this is uh, where this is more prevalent. Hate speech laws um, are almost universally uh, rejected by anti-gender actors for the reasons that I've went through already. Goals also include the exclusion of trans and gender diverse people from single sex spaces and public spaces in general. Um, And there is a reason why toilets, bathrooms and changing facilities are often the central arguing block of these uh, activists because without access to public bathrooms, um, access to public life in general is is very difficult. And this is usually targeted against trans women um, 
and that community of trans people and gender diverse people in general. Particularly in the case of um, legal changes, restrictions or uh, the removal of access to legal gender recognition is increasingly called for. This has unfortunately been seen very recently in Hungary where complete uh, removal of access has been achieved, legislatively at least. But these arguments is often how it's reported, strengthening up legal gender recognition to protect more vulnerable groups um, within society. And alongside that, an abolition of gender affirming healthcare services, especially for young people. Again, these arguments around protecting children, around protecting uh, disabled people, often centre around health and social care services that are aimed at these communities. And the arguments are usually that children should not be able to transition and disabled people should either not be able to transition or go through very long assessment processes, um, ostensibly to protect them from themselves. Now, this focus on gender affirming healthcare services is not usually finished there. Um, it often attacks broader concepts within law around consent and uh, access to health rights in general. And perhaps not surprisingly, Abortion, sexual and reproductive rights services are often the second targets of these. Um, and this is uh, often just a continuation of uh, the far right and ultra conservative groups um, in their long standing uh, work against these services. Limiting disabled people's rights to bodily autonomy um, through mental health legislation, learning disability legislation and restrictions on legal capacity is increasingly common. And ultimately, goals include tipping public opinion against LGBTI people. And I haven't said trans and gender diverse people there because that is often the immediate goal. Um, but we see increasingly evident around much of the world that the ultimate goals it include tipping public opinion against LGBTI communities at large. So this affects trans and gender diverse people. Um, their communities and their access to quality of life in a various number of different ways. So everything on the previous slide, that is how it affects um, these communities. Um, but also then the halting or reversal of increasing um, and improving uh, public opinion towards uh, our communities. So the effects that certainly local to where I am in the UK and Ireland, um, but also in a lot of other countries around the world has been um, that public opinions, although increasing over the last number of years towards trans and gender diverse communities, are beginning to plateau or have begun to uh, roll back down, unfortunately. Now this leads to a, a large number of cascading issues across much of trans people's lives. For example, then a higher level of abuse in various settings, leading from really quite worrying conflations by anti-gender activists of trans communities to sexual abuse, particularly paedophilia and the abuse of children. And then the general radicalization of communities against minority groups. And this is seen across many societies where the rise of the far right has bookmarked a lot of political developments in the 2010s and into the 2020s, that trans and gender diverse communities are often seen as uh, one of the easier groups to target given this history of conflation with sexual crime and LGBTI people. This also then affects political will for progressive uh, changes in legislation, particularly in the area of health and social care. So the public confidence um, from political leaders, from regulators and from medical bodies in adapting and improving their provisions for gender affirming health care are increasingly threatened by these activists. We also see in a number of different countries the adoption of anti-gender stances within left-wing political voices, within left-wing political campaigns and within left-wing governments or ostensibly left-wing governments. And these arguments usually reflect the tools of the anti-trans in our quotes, feminist movements, rather than those of the far right, although they often um, can look very similar. And then where legislation to protect or to provide tools for trans and gender diverse people have existed for a number of years, perhaps even decades, 
The status quo is often argued by these groups as being radical change. So for example, where a country has had legal gender recognition protections for a number of years, they argue that trans people accessing new birth certificates is now a new and, and developing threat. And then this moves the, the window of acceptable discourse on legal protections and uh, progression on these issues much further towards the conservative camp. Effects on gender diverse and, and trans communities are also personal and the negative impact on mental health and well-being can be profoundly seen really wherever these human rights issues are, are commonly debated um, and especially where media coverage is hostile and intense. Uh, the UK is a good example of this, um, Australia, uh, Brazil and a number of countries around the world have particularly intense uh, public media discussions around trans and gender diverse people and their issues and their access to human rights. This then, uh, this sort of public discussion also cascades onto professionals and officials changing their practice without any change in regulation. So for example, health professionals suddenly refusing to refer children or young people to affirming healthcare services or trans people and communities being unable to access legal documentation due to uh, changes in the thoughts or, or preferences of officials who have discretion on those issues. The losses for uh, trans and gender diverse communities can also be community wide and societal. And we are in see we are seeing in, in areas where gender ideology um, language is particularly common that communities are uh, seeing new rejections um, from families, from friends, from neighbors, um, faith communities and society at large usually due to local radicalization. And this is particularly true where that radicalization includes allegations of sexual crime, especially where that involves children. Again, this is nothing new. This is a, a continuation of decades long anti-LGBTI campaigning, but it's a new focus in that respect. We also see a rejection of trans parents and carers who have children themselves and safeguarding uh, may be called into question because the fact that they're trans is seen as a risk to their children. Gender ideology and anti-trans campaigners also affect other groups. Um, discrimination against women is a particularly common example. So where legislation or regulation is proposed to limit trans people's access to public bathrooms and other single sex spaces, it's often seen that um, cisgender women are impacted by that as well. Um, and particularly uh, butch cisgender women and gender non-conforming women, uh, which particularly affects lesbian, gay and bisexual women, are seeing an increase in hostility and abuse in public spaces, especially in, in bathrooms uh, and changing facilities. We also see increased refusal of goods, facilities and services. So really a, a dissolution of perhaps long-standing legal protections in society at large. We also see that the anti-gender arguments spill over into other areas. So, for example, campaigns to restrict gender affirming healthcare services for children and young people introduce philosophical and moral arguments that make restriction of other children's health services much more accessible. So, for example, whereas we see focuses on gender affirming healthcare in one year, that then expands and is adopted by other groups to campaign against sexual and reproductive health services and against children's ability to consent um, to withhold and give consent to treatment in general. This also affects um, disabled people. And although no country in the world has complied with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities at UN treaty level, there have been improvements in, in many countries around disabled people's access to decision making. However, we see this anti-gender work directly eroding those arguments and directly threatening disabled communities' access to justice and access to decision making. We also see host hostility and growing rejection towards the parents and carers of trans children. So not being trans or gender diverse themselves, but because their children are, um, they receive accusations of uh, manipulation, of pressuring, of um, coercion, or of, of sexual crime. Um, this is a, a particularly prevalent issue in a number of countries, and 
is a pretty severe threat uh, to those children as well. So gender radiology is, in a lot of ways, nothing new. It's a continuation of long-term hostility to LGBTI people's rights and the communities that we form. But there are a lot of new tools being used now by anti-rights actors and a lot of new language and frameworks, which ultimately uh, are significant emerging threats across much of the world. So what can organizations do to help this? Ultimately, unambiguous support for trans and gender diverse people. All of your work is the best approach. And that includes speaking up on specific issues. So where trans and gender diverse people's uh, rights are in question in public, standing up and, and supporting unambiguously those rights. And also then inclusion of, of these rights discussions in your work more generally. And this both helps to build a basis of support in the things that you do, but also then introduces others to supportive arguments and helps mitigate the risk that they are radicalized in future. The rejection of anti-rights um, actors wherever they emerge is always important in human rights defense work. And particularly in this anti-gender context, anti-gender activists are appearing in all sorts of areas from academia to philosophy to um, politics to business to non-governmental organizations to human rights defenders themselves uh, and a rejection of these anti-rights arguments wherever they appear is is crucial. So that includes gathering and using resources and uh, existing research uh, to, to press against that. Proactively offering support to trans and gender diverse organizations and movements is really important. Our movement lacks a lot of capacity, often struggles for public platform and runs on shoestring budgets in almost every country in the world. The most well-funded uh, countries for this area of work still operate on tiny budgets compared to other areas of rights and therefore um, offering these three areas of support can be really useful. And then contributing um, to calls for evidence or input if you work in international human rights spaces is also very useful. This can be bringing up specific issues in more general calls or responding to specific ones. But also then, if this is an area where you don't have a lot of capacity to respond, simply supporting other trans and gender diverse people's movements in your submission is, is also very useful. This is not a area of work that is safe 100% of the time. And depending on where you are in the world, there may be different considerations for the safety of your organization, the individuals working there and the communities around you. Safety must be considered in this area of work all the time, especially digital security. We're seeing increasing cybersecurity issues from anti-gender activists targeting uh, online resources, websites and online storage and email systems of uh, human rights defenders. Harassment campaigns are increasingly common, especially on social media and especially in countries with strong anti-gender activists already in at, at work. This is an increasing threat across much of the world. If you are leading an organization, it's important to not just put something out and leave it at that. Um, it's crucial that those on the front line of dealing with the public, of, of receiving emails, phone calls, social media messages, have the tools that they need to clarify messages, to provide um, support to people who need it, um, and that they feel supported by their organization and their movements to uh, keep themselves and the people who they advocate for safe. It's really important to have secure digital platforms with strong protocol to ensure that passwords are changed regularly, that they are unique from account to account, and that uh, two-factor authentication and other digital security means are used to protect the privacy and safety of those within organizations and those who they're supporting. And then mental health and well-being support for people doing this work is important as well. I know personally the public aspects of this work can be incredibly stressful and providing support for that um, for those doing the work is really important. In some regions hostility from state authorities um, including security forces is a is a possibility and where criminalization of trans and gender diverse people uh, is a reality or is a is a feasible threat in future um, or a recent threat in the past um, this is a, a concern that should be uh, considered and then lastly ongoing support is important and trans and gender diverse human rights defenders often do see meaningful and useful support from allied organizations, which is usually welcome, but ongoing support is 
far and away more useful and more productive. Examples um, in my own experience include the organizations being proactively supportive and outspoken about these issues and then not talking about it in future, which is then interpreted by anti-rights campaigners as them having changed their movement, which is then used against trans human rights defenders as evidence that um, the tables are turning um, and the the balance is shifting in the anti-rights movement's favour. Um, so ongoing support is, is crucial. There are a number of things to look for in future. Um, so GATE will be releasing resources and other tools on gender ideology and others. And there are a number of organisations working on gender ideology on a national, regional and international basis. Um, it's really important to keep an eye on local, regional and national sentiments and public opinion uh, towards our communities and to monitor changes in them for a sign of emerging threats. These changes are often instigated by new organizations popping up out of nowhere. The concept of astroturfing is the idea of organizations which seem grassroots and community led actually being funded by big interests or or large lobbies. Um, And we're seeing an increasing uh, funding from conservative bodies in the United States to movements um, in in other parts of the world um, against trans and gender diverse people's rights. New hostility in academic and political spaces, again, seeded by the groups that I've just mentioned. Also, then new research in support um, of trans and gender diverse people's rights. Uh, there was a, a lot of research going on in most areas uh, of, of rights, quality of life and, and experiences of our communities. And it's important to keep on track of what that research says. And then also to keep an eye on oppositional research, um, which may be from uh, these organizations that I've mentioned, but also maybe from sometimes well-meaning, sometimes not at all well-meaning uh, researchers um, who who are putting forward uh, perhaps different views. And then novel focuses on anti-gender activism. This, we currently see that the focus on gender ideology is perhaps a specialization of anti-LGBTI campaigning over the decades. Um, but keep a lookout and keep an eye on new focuses on children and young people, disabled people, um, women, especially lesbian women. Safeguarding and protection are very common tools by anti-gender activists. And it's very important to cast a critical eye on these arguments where they're brought forward. Like many anti-rights arguments, they're often based in small kernels of truth. So small um, examples of where people have had their rights impinged or have not been supported properly um, or based in historical or contemporary social attitudes which are harmful. So, for example, that uh, disabled people need to be protected or that LGBTI people are a threat to children. Um, So these novel focuses are really important to take a look at. So that is our presentation on gender ideology. I hope it's been useful. You can contact GATE um, online via our website and you can also contact me directly. Thank you very much for listening and I hope this has been useful.